And you may now take off your face mask if you would like to do so. And just as a reminder, we do ask people to remain in your seats for the entire service. If you absolutely have to get up, please put your face mask back on, fully cover your nose and mouth. And if you're going to be walking within six feet of anyone, make sure you give them a chance to do the same. And so keep those face masks handy. And I just want to welcome everybody to church today. Aloha. It's so good to see everyone. I'm Alan Akana, the kahu or pastor of the church. I welcome everyone today. I know we've got some guests, some visitors. I welcome you especially. And if anyone's here for the first time, make sure you get one of our welcome packets. There's a gift in there for you and uh, some information about the church and also a visitor card. And that way, you can know a little more about us and get the gift, and also we can learn a little bit about you as well. On the top of page five are our temporary worship guidelines for the pandemic, and if you haven't been here for a while or this is your first time, please fa uh, familiarize yourself with those guidelines because we wanna, number one, just make sure everybody is safe and feels safe while you're in worship today. And one of the things that we're doing differently during the pandemic is we're not passing around an offering plate. So if you have been particularly blessed by our time together, we invite you to leave a gift either in the communion or at the communion table in the offering bowl or also right by the main doors we have an offering basket and you can always give online as well. So if you'd like to give, we ask you um, to do that. And then um, I think all the rest of the announcements are pretty much self-explanatory um, on the rest of um, page five and six. I will remind you, however, that in two weeks, October 24th, is our 
Commitment Sunday here, and that's when we ask our members and the friends who give regularly to the church to fill out a commitment card, which you'll be getting very soon, and to bring that with you. And on Commitment Sunday, we bless all the commitments for the following year. And so we always appreciate those. Um, today's theme is generous love. We're looking at God's love in four different ways during the month of October. And today, I would invite you to think of a time when you experienced love that you would describe as just over-the-top, generous love from someone else. Think about what that was like, what it looked like, and probably more importantly, what it felt like. And just sit with that for a moment as we begin our worship service today. Good morning. Call to worship. Come let us give thanks for the generous love of God. Let us give thanks for the days of our lives, for each day brings new opportunities to experience God's love. A new and to share God's love with others let our hearts be filled with joy for God's love sacks our longing. Our opening prayer is taken from Psalm 90. Let us pray. O Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. A thousand years in your sight, whoops, our days may come to 70 or 80 if our strength endures. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad of all our days. Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 34, verses 8 to 14. Listen for the word of God. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in God. Fear the Lord for holy people for those who fear God lacking nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good things, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. Today's New Testament reading is from Paul's second letter to Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 5 to 15. Listen for the word of God. So I thought it was necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangement for the generous gift you have promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generous will also reap generous. Each of you should give you, have decided in your heart to give reluctantly or under compulsion, for God's love is a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless us abundantly so that all things and time, having all that you need, you will abund in every good work as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. The righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, generosity will result in thanking God. This service that you perform not only supplies the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions thanks to God. 
because of the service of which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. And in their prayers, for your hearts go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. Today's gospel reading is from John 13, verses 34, 35. Listen for the word of God. Today's gospel reading is from John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Listen for the word of God. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you may love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. May God bless the reading of the word and our hearts be open to receive it. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care, God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned skies of parchment made were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. O oh, love of God, how and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When the Apostle Paul wrote the letter, 2 Corinthians, he was writing to the followers of Jesus in the city of Corinth. Many people think this was his second letter to the Corinthians, but it was possibly the third or maybe even the fourth. We don't really know. What we do know is in 1 Corinthians, which came before 2 Corinthians, Paul had talked about a previous letter. And one of the things that I learned in seminary was that Paul wrote many letters and we only have a small handful of them left that made it into the New Testament. So in about the year 50, so we're talking almost 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and Galatians and 1 Thessalonians. Now I want you to know that at this time, none of the gospels as we know of them today were written. 
Mark probably came at least 10, maybe 20 or more years later. Matthew and Luke, even later than that, and John much later. So by the time the people in Corinth were actually reading about Jesus' birth and his life and all the things he did and his specific teachings, the people that were reading 1st and 2nd Corinthians were probably long gone. They probably died years before that. And the reason I point this out is because when people were reading... 1st and 2nd Corinthians, there's so much that they didn't know yet about Jesus that we know today. The other reason I pointed out is because there's a lot that they probably did know from the Apostle Paul and from others that we don't know about because there were dozens, literally, and maybe even hundreds of letters that Paul wrote, um, along with other apostles and leaders of the church, that became extinct over the years. So there's all this teaching that went out and all these not only positive encouragements, but also reprimands to these various churches, including the church in Corinth. We don't know a lot about exactly what theology the people in Corinth had. What we do know, however, is that they knew enough about Jesus to devote their lives to him as their Lord and Savior. In fact, they knew enough about Jesus that they literally risked their lives to follow Jesus. They were committed. They were 100% committed, fully on board. Now, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, which was probably 2nd or 3rd or 4th Corinthians to them, it was basically a letter of reprimand. And we talked about this last week in, in my message, how the Corinthians were being selfish, and egotistical, including some of the leaders who were saying things like, well, I am the pastor, so I'm better than you, or I have a direct line with God, so my opinion is more, and my beliefs is, are way more important than yours. And so Paul basically wrote 1 Corinthians to scold them and say, stop it. We are the body of Christ, and just like a human body that has a head and arms and feet and legs, The body of Christ, the church, must work together. Well, whatever it was that happened after 1 Corinthians was received by the followers of Jesus in Corinth, it worked. Something happened because as you read 2 Corinthians, which is 3rd or 4th or 5th Corinthians, you get a totally different feel. It's a completely different flavor. When you read 1 Corinthians, it's it's kind of like, you know, I'm scolding you because you're really messing up. You've missed the point of Jesus altogether. You're talking about who's better than others, and you're ignoring some people because of their beliefs. And, you know, remember, they hadn't even gotten the Gospels yet, and they're arguing about what's the right and wrong theology, and my theology is better than yours, and putting people down because some people thought they had a more direct line to God. In 2 Corinthians... As we read through this beautiful book, it's, it's, a, it's a story of hope. Basically, 1st and 2nd Corinthians together is a story of hope for the church. Because what we see in 2nd Corinthians is this wonderful change that has taken place among the believers of Jesus in Corinth. This community that was becoming the church. And we know that the Corinthians weren't perfect yet. And Paul knew that, but he points to their generosity. So 1 Corinthians, the focus is scolding for people not getting along. It's a church in crisis and in conflict. 2 Corinthians, Paul is basically saying, you guys have changed for the better. In fact, he talks about a generous gift. And we don't know how much this gift was, and it's obvious that some of it was financial. We don't know what all was involved, but it was so generous, and I'm going to say so large, 
that Paul felt it was necessary to send some of his fellow ministers out in the mission field to go to Corinth to help them prepare to give the, to give the gift for further ministry. So they went from arguing and being selfish and being greedy and egotistical to, let, to somehow letting go of at least most of that, if not all of it, and just saying, you know, what's really important is this message of love that Jesus brought to us about God's love and, and what it means for us. We can put our differences aside and, you know, we can be really generous. Now, there were some places that Paul went where the church was very poor, and he talks about that. You can read the book of Acts and some of the letters, and you realize some of the places where people were worshiping together, they were really struggling in poverty. And you get the sense that that wasn't the case at all in Corinth. This was a thriving, metropolitan, cosmopolitan part of modern-day Greece where lots of commerce was taking place, and some of the people that came to the church had benefited from that, and they were able to give more than others. And so Paul says to them, I'm aware of this generous gift that you're about to give, but one of the reasons he sends some of his fellow ministers to the church of Corinth is he wants to make sure that they give in a spirit of generosity. And he talks about that. He talks about a generous gift. And he says, I want to make sure that you're not giving grudgingly. And in the Greek language, that basically just means, well, it means several things. But one is, it's not a greedy kind of giving. It's not like, well, I'm giving in order to get. It's just a heartfelt giving out of gratitude. Grudgingly can also mean, I'm going to give as little as possible and still kind of have some standing in the church. Paul was just saying, nope. And, and it also means giving out of obligation. Like, I am going to give a gift to the church because I feel like I have to. It's expected. What Paul is saying is, let go of all of that. Whatever you give, to the church. Give generously because God loves a cheerful giver. And I think what Paul is getting at here is not that God stops loving you if you're not cheerful or God doesn't love you as much if you don't give as much or give as much cheerfully. I think what Paul is really getting at here is God absolutely loves it. When you get the secret of a truly joy-filled and content and cheerful life. And that has to do with realizing that all that we have in life and all of our blessings are a gift from God and sometime a, sometimes a gift from God through other people. And because of your gratitude, you generously give back. It's, it's a rhythm and it's a pattern. And some of you know that I've been actually reading some Buddhist books lately, and one of the principles of Buddhism has to do with the fact that generosity is actually woven into the very fabric of existence in all the earth. Every living creature both receives and gives back one way or another whether they realize it or not, including human beings. And the teaching would actually go on to say in, in the Buddhist traditions, think of breathing. You inhale oxygen, which gives life to every cell in your body. And you inhale that, and then you exhale, and carbon dioxide goes out to all the plants and trees, and, and it's just a constant natural thing that happens. And in the Buddhist tradition, the idea here is that that's what we're created for in every way. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from or where you live or what you do or how much money you have. It's just a constant receiving and giving, inhaling and exhaling. Now, we know that there are many people today and throughout history that don't get that. And it's all about getting as much as I can for myself, 
keeping as much as I can and hoarding it for myself, giving away only as little as I possibly can get away with, and having so much stuff that just weighs us down, whether it's material possessions or our popularity or being noticed by people for something special that we think we aren't good enough for otherwise. But it's this idea of just constantly realizing that all of life naturally is about giving, receiving, and then giving back. It's a pattern. It's a rhythm. And it's the most natural thing that we do. And when we catch ourselves not doing that, it's like inhaling all the time. And once in a while, exhaling just a little bit. It just doesn't work. It's got to be both. Giving and receiving. The constant pattern, the constant rhythm. And as I was reading through both 1st and 2nd Corinthians last week and this week, I think, you know, that really seems to be what Paul was getting at because that's what Jesus was all about. It's, it's realizing that everything that we have and, and even the things we don't realize and forget to give thanks for are just blessings from God. It's the receiving. And, and the greatest joy that we have in life is when we receive those things with open hearts and open hands and open arms, and then just as openly with equally open hearts, share them with others. So last week, I was sharing with the congregation about several people in the almost 200-year history of this church who had given so much love. I talked about how love is unfailing and unending, and no matter what it is that you give to the church, if it's accompanied with true love, that love stays in that church and in that place for eternity. And so I mentioned some of the people who had given in that way over the long period of time from 1834 when the first person came here, Peter Gulick, and established the church. But today I want to talk about one person in particular who I've mentioned before, but we haven't really given him, I think, the attention that he truly deserves. Somebody that just gave to this church and this community so generously. In 1849, Jared Smith, Jared Knapp Smith, was born basically across the street from here, just down a little ways. The California gold rush was just getting started about that time. The, the sugar industry was already developing right here in Koloa. And his dad was Dr. James Smith, who was the medical doctor for all of Kauai and Ni'ihau. And Jared Smith grew up basically across the street at home and throughout this area where the church was and down by the beach and up in the mountains. He grew up playing with his brothers and sisters and with a small handful of other Caucasian English-speaking kids that were about his age. But primarily, most of his friends were native Hawaiian that spoke Hawaiian. So he learned Hawaiian at a very early age and grew up in this community with his dad as the medical doctor for the entire island here and Ni'ihau. And when Jared finished school, he went to the mainland, to the East Coast, went to school, and he got his medical degree. And he came back here to Koloa to basically help his dad, and eventually his dad turned over his medical practice to him. So Jared, at that point, was the only Western-trained medical doctor for all of this island and all of Ni'ihau. When James Smith, his dad, first came here, most people in the islands hadn't heard of leprosy known today as Hansen's disease. 
So in the early 1840s, just really wasn't an issue. However, by the time Jared Smith grew up here, went to medical school, came back, Hansen's disease was spread, widespread, throughout all of the islands and affected most communities. And I'm just going to tell you that my ancestors and all Hawaiian people dreaded leprosy, probably more than anything else in life. Because, imagine this, your most important value, or values, being family, and not just your mom and dad and uh, siblings, but your extended family, your, your tutus, your grandparents, your cousins, your, your community. But imagine if family and community were the highest values to you. And, and not only that, but your ancestors and the spirit of your ancestors, which resided in the place and guided you and your family. And you had grown up believing that family, community, and being amongst the spirit of your ancestors in that place was life. And then somebody said to you, you know, if you get this dreadful skin disease, we're going to take you away from all that's important to you, and we're going to put you on an isolated peninsula that you can never leave and nobody else can ever get to unless they also have leprosy, on this isolated peninsula on Molokai called Kalopapa, with strangers that you've never met before, in a strange location, with whatever you can carry with you. You have to leave everyone behind. You leave the spirits of your ancestors behind. And even worse, when you die, your spirit's probably going to be over there in that strange place with all those strangers rather than where it belongs, right here in this place. So people, when they found out during those days that they had Hansen's disease, typically went into hiding. And some of you may have heard the story of Ko'olau who found out that he had leprosy and immediately went up into the mountains of Koke'e and Kalalau, he and his son who also had leprosy and his wife who didn't have leprosy and never got it, went into hiding and the sheriff and some deputies, some soldiers found him and he shot and killed them. He would rather kill somebody than go to this place called Kalopapa. It was just the worst thing possible. And so many people, dozens at least, probably hundreds actually, of people here on Kauai and in Koloa, when they found out that they had Hansen's disease, they immediately went up into the mountains and went into hiding. Well, one day, a woman by the name of Pow Pow arrived at Jared, Dr. Jared Smith's office, his medical practice, with her 13-year-old daughter, Pua. They both had something going on with their skin, and he diagnosed that they both had leprosy. And he told them that they had to report to the officials, and they knew what that meant. They would have to leave their community, the only life they knew, and go to that strange place among strangers and die a long, slow death there, and then their spirits forever would probably be lost somewhere, maybe never coming back to being with their people. And so Pua and her mother, Pau Pau, went and told the family, in including Pau Pau's, the, the man that she lived with, Kayo, and Kayo had two nephews, and they all talked about, well, what are we going to do? Well, I can only imagine that telling a Hawaiian that he or she had leprosy had to be one of the worst possible jobs for Jared Smith. That was probably, out of everything he hated doing, that was probably at the top of the list, the worst thing possible. But he had to do it. Well, this family was trying to figure out what to do, and one evening at the end of September, Jared Smith heard a knock or a, a bang or something at, on the front porch, 
And again, this was just right across the street, right over here. And he went out to see what it was, didn't see anything in the dark, it was nighttime, so he turned around and one of the nephews of Kayo shot him at point blank and killed him. And his life was over. Now, Jared Smith was absolutely beloved in this community, especially by the Hawaiian people. Nobody could understand who in the world would kill such a beloved person. They loved his dad when he was alive. And now, what they knew about Jared was not only that he was a good doctor and that he practiced the very best medicine and health care that Western medicine could provide to these lands, but he was very sensitive to the Hawaiian culture as well. In fact, he was committed to actually ending leprosy at the time. And he would go to the Kahuna Lapa'au, or the indigenous leaders who studied herbal medicines and natural homeopathy, which we would call it today. But he would actually say, okay, here's what Western medicine does. What do you guys do that works? That maybe there's something we can do together. And so he wasn't at all opposed to the Lapa'au. And the people knew that. And he actually discovered through meeting with one of the Kahuna Lapa Ao that there was a, a, a skin ointment that they had created out of some of the plants that grow up here in the mountains that actually made leprosy better. It didn't cure it, but he said, well, at least it's something. So they knew him for being a person that was incredibly dedicated to their health care incredibly sensitive to their culture. And on top of that, he and his sister Juliet founded the Koloa Industrial School for boys and young men. They realized that a lot of the Hawaiians didn't have opportunities that so many other people were having that were coming here from all over the world. And so he wanted to make sure that the Hawaiians that were living in this community and on this part of the island had some kind of academic training he taught them trades, and whatever it else it was that he felt could help them. And then as I was doing some further research this week, I came across the fact that he looked around and saw all of these Hawaiian people right here in Koloa on the South Shore that, were, that did not own land. And he just thought, if I don't help them, they're never going to own any land. And basically, the Hawaiian people used to kind of own it all, although they never thought of it in that way. And that's one of the reasons they didn't own land. And like the sugar industry and others were just buying up the land. So he got almost 50, I think 46 or 47 Hawaiians together. And they basically all put what they could into the pot. And they bought 3,500 acres of land out at Mahalapu, and they were called the Mahalapu or Mahaulepu Hui. They were a group that actually were Hawaiian landowners for the first time in their lives. And I, I don't know all the history of Hawaiian land ownership, but I'm just going to tell you, for a small group of Hawaiians to own 3,500 acres who had never owned land before, that was huge. And so people in this community and all over the island, and in fact all over Hawaii, they loved Jared Smith. But as I said, leprosy was the worst possible thing that could happen to you if you were Hawaiian. And people often took desperate measures to keep from going to Kalopapa. And so they... Basically, the, the two nephews of Kayo shot Jared Smith, thinking he was the only one that knew that Pau Pau and Pua had leprosy, and perhaps if they killed him, then they wouldn't have to go to Kalapapa. Well, I tell you this sad story, because Jared Smith was one of those people that was so committed to this church. 
His dad had been a pastor here. He was a member here. His family was a member here. And he gave in every possible way to this church and to the community. He risked his life. In fact, he gave his life quite literally for this community. And as I was reading several stories about Jared Smith this week, I was just so moved, almost to tears actually, thinking, wow, there are so many people in this church's history that have just given so much because that's just what they naturally do, did and continue to do. And that's what generosity is. It's not even thinking about it so much. It's just saying, of course, all these gifts from, come from God. Of course, these are all blessings that I don't deserve. And therefore, of course, with gratitude, I'm going to give back to God in whatever way possible. Well, every year at the end of September, Tom Armbruster and his wife, Linda, give flowers in memory of Jared Smith. And that's what these, this beautiful arrangement is today. Tom, I believe, is the great, great um, nephew of Jared Smith. And he doesn't want us to forget Uncle Jared and all that Jared gave to this church and this community. So when you look at these flowers and the, the, the beautiful arrangement that was put together in memory of Jared, I invite you to think and give thanks for his generosity. And think of others in this church that have been generous, others in your life that have been generous to you. And think about how you can give, not just because you're supposed to, because, but because that's just how we are created, to receive with open hearts and to give with open hearts as well. So each year during the month of October, we invite people from the church, members and friends, to, to come and share with us a little bit about the love and the gifts that they've received from this church and, and the importance of giving back as well. And today I've asked Nancy Murphy if she would come and share with us for just a moment. So, Nancy. Aloha. I wanted to start by telling you a, a small story that, about my, my life. Uh, when I was a little girl, um, I had a very beloved grandmother. And uh, her father, my, who I'd never met, my great-grandfather, he had brought, after his wife died, his five children, my grandmother being the oldest girl, uh, from Georgia to Oklahoma at that time, which was Oklahoma Territory. It was in, I think, 1899. He was a Methodist circuit minister. And my grandmother uh, had to quit school and raise the, the smaller children. Um, every night, I would, when I got to stay with her, I'd go to bed and, and sleep with her, and she'd tell me stories, old stories. One of the stories I actually still have documentation of is when they arrived in Oklahoma on the train, uh, they were picked up immediately by some of the church members who had brought my great-grandfather there in a buckboard and immediately took them to a church revival right off the train. Uh, he started preaching. And, I, and ultimately, he also founded, founded a small Methodist church in western Oklahoma in a town called McLeod. My grandmother, when I knew her, uh, I, I didn't get to have her in my life long for 11 years, and she was in her mid-70s to mid-80s when I knew her. I remember she didn't have a lot, but she would take me with her uh, to my uh, <laughs> to my objections. She would take me with her to go visiting. Uh, she, she would walk, because she couldn't drive, around the neighborhood, visiting all of the older ladies who were single and didn't have a lot. She always brought something. She always stayed to see how they were doing. 
course, I was young and didn't want to do that, but now I have such an appreciation for what she shared with them and what my grandfather, my great-grandfather shared. Uh, I wonder, you know, because of her, I'm who I am, and because of who I am, I share that, and I would never have imagined I would be standing here. I would have never imagined I would go into the medical profession, but everything that he did spread, everything that she did spread, everything I hope that I do spreads uh, to everybody that I meet and see. You know, I was adopted uh, as an infant, and if I hadn't been adopted, I would never have known that beautiful, beautiful family who raised me. And so I just want to say that life may seem random, um, and I think in a way it is random, and we can't know or expect what's going to come up next. But I think that that's a blessing because that brings us closer to depending on God. And, it, and as long as we do that, it brings us many blessings, the blessings that we then can not only enjoy but share with others. Uh, I think that is the light of God, and, and that we are the light of God, and you guys are the light of God. Uh, my experience here at Kaloa Union Church is that very thing. It's just, I'm, I'm going to be leaving soon, and it's a period in my life that I've come here, and it was just such a blessing and just so random. But was it? I don't know. It felt random. But the blessings I've gained here, the blessings of fellowship, the blessings of friendship, the blessings of being able to have spiritual guidance, those are things I will always carry with me, not only off of this island, but that I've been able to carry with me while I was here to those veterans that I see who suffer greatly but I hope I bring light to, and I bring that light because of the support of this church and my God. So I just want to say um, that I appreciate everything about this church, everything that you've done for me, all your welcoming and your love and the opportunities to sing and play music and have friends. And it's just been a ginormous blessing in my life, and I know without saying it, that you will continue to provide that for all who come here and in your lives outside of this church. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. For those of you that don't know, Nancy is the uh, psychiatrist at the Veterans Administration and gives to this community and to our, and to our veterans in so many ways and also has been our volunteer accompanist and piano player for oh, over a year now and we just deeply appreciate the gifts that you have given to us. It's now time for the sharing of joys and concerns and this is a time where we invite people to share anything that they have on a card and we've got some cards today and um, also uh, at least one other thing. So. Um, this is from uh, Vicki and Terry. Ask for prayers for two sisters, Sandy Wilson and Susan Whiting. And so um, we will keep both sisters, Sandy and Susan, in our prayers. And then also, uh, let's see here. Tomorrow is a holiday, Columbus Day, Indigenous Persons Day. Um, Oh, this is a note from the office saying both both Penny, our administrative assistant, and I have a bunch of appointments tomorrow, so we, we kind of have to work, and we're going to take another day off. So the church office will be open. I think that's the message. So thank you, Penny. Um, and then Penny, uh, sad to share that Charles Reb Sr. passed away on Tuesday. So we'll pray for their family, or for his family. Um, from Amber, share aloha. Uh, need some names of local families for our Thanksgiving food boxes and Christmas stocking outreach. And that's something we do every year here in terms of our outreach over the holidays on the South Shore. 
and then a celebration. Kay and I celebrated our 53rd anniversary, and we got our boosters, and that's from Penny, who I think is also having a birthday coming up. So, And then I just got some sad news this morning, personally. Um, a, a man by the name of Tim Taylor, who was the chairman of the board at the church where I was a pastor in um, Texas, in Dallas, about 12 years ago, passed away, I think, just over the weekend. And so let us pray for Tim's family and uh, friends and also the church in Dallas, Cathedral of Hope. And we also, as always, have many prayer requests that are given on page 7, and I invite you to pray regularly. I know some of the people in our church pray every week for all the names um, on, on this list, as do I. And I would just invite you to take a moment to consider the, both the joys and the uh, concerns that I've just shared and also the concerns that are listed on page 7. And let's just have a moment of silence as we give thanks to God for our blessings and also as we pray for all those who have needs. Let us pray together in silence. Holy and generous God, we acknowledge your grace and how very generous you are to all of us. And we give you thanks for life, for the celebrations, the anniversaries and birthdays that we celebrate, the opportunities to be able to come together. And as this pandemic is slowly easing up a bit the opportunities that we have to travel and to be together once again with people we love. God, we also give thanks for all of the outreach that happens in this church and as we start preparing later in this fall for our Thanksgiving food boxes and then after that for our Christmas stockings for families in need here on the South Shore. Oh God, may we be generous to them and also acknowledge who and, and discover who are the families that are in the most need. And if there are families out there that we're not aware of, please bring them to our attention so that we can reach out to them. And we know that we make such a difference in the lives of those families and in particular, those children in our community. God, we pray for those that have recently lost loved ones. We pray for the friends and family of Charles Reb Sr., for Tim Taylor, and for so many others that have passed away recently. God, bless them with comfort and with hope and with fond memories that they will hold like treasures. God, we also know that there are people in our community and on our hearts, many whom we don't even know what their needs are. When we think of Sandy and Susan, God, whatever it is that their needs are, we ask that you fulfill them. We also know that many of the people that we love are sick and injured and recovering from illnesses and surgeries, and we pray for healing for all of them, those that are on our prayer list and those who are not. And God, may we, as this community of faith, be open to being available in any way that we can to provide that comfort and healing. And God, as always, we pray for healing in this divided nation as well as an end to all injustice, to racism, and to all forms of violence. Oh God, 
on this day in which we celebrate your generous love. May we not only open our hearts and give thanks, but may we then turn to others with open hearts as well, offering the same generosity and love that you have given to us. We pray this and all things in the faithful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, Steve. Beautiful song, one of my favorites. And it's now time to put our face masks back on, and uh, I would invite you to do so now. Make sure you fully cover your nose and mouth, and uh, please remember to keep it on until you're either back in your vehicle or fully off the church property. I now invite you to stand for the benediction. And that uh, song, His Eye is on the Sparrow, is such a good reminder that God is always watching over us in love. And may we receive that love with open hearts, with open hands, and also with that same openness, share that love with others. May the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.